following interview was conducted with Noble Kaiser Jr., the son of Purdue football coach from 1930 to 1936 and athletic director from 1933 to 1940, father, on Friday, October 23, 2009, at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Good afternoon, Miss Dr. Kaiser, and we'll let you start with where else were you were born and early years. Okay, well, thank you, Catherine. <coughs> I'm uh, pleased to be here. Uh, I was born and raised in West Lafayette. Okay. Uh, Dad, uh, Dad and Mom uh, got married, I think, in 27, and my brother, Dick, was the firstborn in 29, and then I was born in 34. So okay. and that was the end of the, that was too many kids. <laughs> Two was plenty. Um, and, uh, Where'd you live in West Lafayette? We lived at, I always say, at the bottom of Ravinia Road, if you're familiar with that. Uh, there's kind of an English Tudor type home there. And we lived there um, oh, for about the first uh, maybe three years of my life. And then we they built a home on Forest Hill Drive up a couple blocks north. And uh, we moved in there, I think, in around 1938, something like that. Um, Tell about early years in school. And yeah, uh, I still believe that uh, we went to Morton School, and I still maintain that not every day, but we walked to school, <laughs> which was a good hike from from north from where end. Where you were living, that's north right. North end, sure. because beyond us on the north, you you could hear the cows in the morning oh, wow. <laughs> mooing. So there wasn't much north of us. Um, and then we went to uh, junior high, uh, which is near the campus, or was, it's gone now. And then uh, when I got into high school, of course the high school was just a block away from where we lived. And uh, so I could sleep in a little more. <laughs> and the walk was, was shorter. Oh yes, yeah. yes. Um, West Lafayette was, uh, then, like it is now, the, the high school system, the school system was almost a uh, um, college prep type high school. Sure. And uh, our senior year especially, we were taking English courses and stuff that was um, about the same as you'd get as a freshman at Purdue. And so we had an advantage then, and I'm, I'm sure they're even better at it <laughs> now than they were then. Um, so I got into a Purdue. Uh, what about in high school? Any clubs or athletics or anything that you participated in? Oh, football? yeah, I played football, basketball. Uh, I was in high Y at that time. Um, I was in the. I played clarinet and saxophone. I was in the marching band, the orchestra, the dance band. Uh, the Red Devil Rhythm Kings, <laughs> which wow, <laughs> quite a coterie of boys. Yeah, yeah, right. So that uh, I enjoyed that, and that took a lot of time and, and effort. But uh, we had a good band director, uh, Marshall Howenstein, and um, he uh, he put us through our paces. Um, did the but band play, a, excuse me, did the band play for the, like they do with the football games? Did they, the band, did you oh play? Oh, yeah. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. We, we had night games, of course, oh, at the high school field, which is, was down at the bottom of the hill from the high school. Now that's moved out further. But, uh, yeah, we even, uh, Howenstein had us get little lights for our caps. We had, you know, regular captain's caps. And uh, so at halftime, they'd, get us marching around, they'd turn out all the lights, and so we'd be marching around with just their little lights. <laughs> we thought that was pretty neat, but it was, sounds a little corny today. <laughs> well, it was a good effect, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. But uh, I, I enjoyed uh, sports. I tried out for baseball and uh, found out I couldn't bend over far enough to catch a grounder, <laughs> so I, let alone try and hit the ball. So I just stuck to basketball and football. Okay, that sounds good. But uh, I was uh, a little over six feet and about 150 pounds, so 
when I went to Purdue, I wasn't about to try and go out for football at Purdue. <laughs> no, I don't think so. My brother was, was bigger than I was, and he had already tried that when he went, went to Purdue, and he said he lasted about eight weeks, and he said, those guys from Pennsylvania that they're bringing in here are trying to kill you. They're really boiling, right? <laughs> yeah. Like our original team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Um, Anyway, my intention was to uh, go to a business school and get a business education. I kind of grew up with my grandparents uh, off and on and uh, who were retailers in the music business. And so I enjoyed retailing and wanted to get into that kind of business. Um, my freshman year, though, I was pretty much set to go down to Bloomington to that school in the south and uh, my mother became ill or more ill she had a brain tumor and uh, so we had to put her to bed in uh, December of my freshman year at Purdue um, I joined the Phi Gamma Delta fraternity uh, which was a good thing they were very supportive and uh, at any rate, uh, by the next August, uh, mother passed away. So I still had time to transfer, and I started my sophomore year down at IU. Uh, I did all right, but uh, I was wondering what, what direction I really wanted to go in. So uh, I dropped out, uh, and a friend of mine, uh, along with me, Jim Hawkins. His dad was Dean of Engineering at Purdue at that time. George Hawkins? George Hawkins, yeah. Jim and I both dropped out and uh, we had joined the uh, Army Reserve. So we applied for active duty and we're, we were having trouble get, getting into the Army, believe it or not. What year would this have been? This was 1954. Okay, just after <clears> the Korean War was over. Fortunately, we, we were right in between Korea and Vietnam, right. so thank goodness. So Jim asked, uh, and I asked his dad if he could help us. And well, he, he knew the commander of the National Guard in Indiana or something like that, so they pulled some strings so we could get in the Army by November because we were starting to waste away, and I think his dad probably got tired of us <laughs> hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to move on. Yeah, yeah. So I went in the Army for uh, two years <clears throat> and uh, went to Fort Leonard Wood for my basic training and then went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts for a six month training in uh, Morse Code Intercept uh, job. And uh, that was interesting. Uh, we we went to school, they, they had three shifts going to school for this kind of training. And we were on the four to 12 shift at night. <laughs> but uh, we got used to it. Sure, yeah. Then they uh, found out they had enough Morse code intercept operators. And as we were getting ready to graduate, we had, I had said, well, I w I'd like to go to Hawaii or Europe or the Far East. Uh, we ended up in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, <laughs> about 55 of us, <laughs> wondering what happened. So we spent the rest of the out there, rest of our service out there in Arizona. I loved Arizona, uh, weather-wise, but it's uh, fairly desolate. <laughs> uh, so then I came back, uh, went back to IU, and uh, I got some credit hours for serving in the Army. So with that and uh, going to summer school the following summer, uh, I was able to graduate in uh, December of uh, 57. And, uh, From what you then, yeah. And then uh, I met my wife um, while I was down there and we got married in uh, August of 58. And uh, we both went to work for L.S. Ayers in Indianapolis, retailer. And that's when they were just starting to get into the mall business. 
the malls were getting to be the thing then. So I was I was a buyer in men's uh, furnishings and going through the throes of taking merchandise out to the Glendale Mall and uh, figuring out how to do all that. It was interesting. Well, then my stepfather uh, was in real estate and insurance here in Lafayette, Bud Winfield, and he said, why don't you come up and go into business with me, and then when I'm ready to retire, you can have it, and so forth. And I thought, mm -hmm. that sounds pretty good. Sure. So we came up here and uh, uh, late 59, I think it was. I'm not sure about that date, but anyway, I worked with Bud long enough to know that we weren't going to see eye to eye on much of anything. So we had a mutual parting of the ways and uh, got an interview with the Sears manager and uh, also with the Penny, J.C. Penny manager in Lafayette. And uh, at the time, uh, the Sears story sounded better than Penny's, so I joined Sears and uh, started my career there, which uh, went from oh, uh, our three children, uh, two girls and a boy were all born at, at home hospital um, in Lafayette. Uh, so we picked up the family and moved to Newark, Ohio, and then down to Ashland, Kentucky, and then back up to Columbus, Ohio. And uh, <clears throat> that was about the end of my retail career because I didn't I didn't want to be a store manager. Things were changing in in Sears and they they kept changing as it turned out. Quite an evolution, but uh, I didn't want to be a store manager because they were losing all their autonomy, uh, everything be, being centralized and that type of thing. So I got I got a job that the the move from Ashland to uh, Columbus was because I wanted to get into, at that time, personnel. So I became personnel manager at the new Westland Sears store in Columbus. And, uh, at Columbus, Ohio? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that started me on a, uh, a path for a staff-type job, which I was much more comfortable with and felt more worth, worthwhile. Uh, that that developed into uh, an experience with uh, through Sears being loaned to the National Alliance of Businessmen, and I was on loan to them first of all to run the office in Columbus, Ohio, and we worked with uh, community agencies trying to place disadvantaged people in jobs because that was. As today, it was tough for disadvantaged people to get jobs, and uh, so I did that for about a year, year and a half, and then I was asked if I'd like to be on the national staff in Washington. Um, I uh, talked to my wife about that, and uh, she said, well, if that's what you want to do, give it a try. So for a year, I commuted. From Columbus, I'd leave uh, uh, Sunday evening and get back home Monday or Friday night. And I was a vice president of Veterans Affairs for the uh, National, National Alliance. Alliance of Business at the national office, and that was a tremendous experience in a lot of ways. But then I came back uh, in about '74, and. Uh, was kind of in limbo for a while because being away from the the politics of the local store system, uh, I was a little bit out in left field. But then this job opened in uh, Skokie, Illinois, with the Midwestern Territory, and I, I went up there as a representative in the public relations and government affairs department. And I followed that path until I retired in. Uh, 1990, uh, and I had told me I had 31 years with Sears, and uh, it worked out worked out very well. Except the retirement was not my idea; it was Sears. <laughs> uh, I was 57 at the time and not ready to retire, 
but they uh, restructured and uh, kind of wiped out our department. Uh, it was one of those years when it looked like the expenses were getting out of hand and uh, they always start in those kind of departments to eliminate expenses. Yeah. And the boss said, I guess we're making too much money. So <laughs> so I, got a, I tried real estate in Buffalo Grove, Illinois, and uh, didn't really care for that. Um, so I got a, several consulting jobs, uh, one with the National Retail Federation in Washington doing state legislative affairs business following legislation in all 50 states and, uh, and then printing a monthly bulletin for the for the retail companies uh, that was interesting and then along came uh, McDonald's uh, corporation and they were having problems with uh, a law in the state of Iowa that would fouled up their franchising program quite a bit so they asked me if I could help out with that, so I did that, and uh, and that as that was winding down, uh, we decided that Chicago was really too expensive to to live you in. You lived outside Chicago. You didn't live yeah, in, yeah, no, we yeah. lived. Uh, Buffalo Grove is about thirty thirty five miles yeah. northwest of uh, downtown. So we uh, uh, moved uh, back down to Lafayette. My brother was still uh, in, in retirement but he was still living here and we had a lot of friends that we had met uh, when we were down here originally. As and your wife was still, did she still have family in Indianapolis? That's where she was from? Oh yes, okay. we, we uh, made the trip to Indianapolis every which way from Ashland, Kentucky and <laughs> up along the, the river. The road went there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anything that went there. Um, and uh, so the retirement here uh, since 1995 has been very, uh, very uh, wonderful for both of us. Uh, I've, I've just took the approach of trying to give back to the community because I felt like I owed a lot to West Lafayette and Lafayette. And uh, so I joined the Lafayette Kiwanis Club and I've spent my year as president of that club. It's a great bunch of people. Um, I'm with the Sycamore, Sycamore Audubon Society, and I'm still on the board of that. I was president for a while, but and I could be today because we <laughs> there's such a small cadre of board members that uh, we kind of took turns. Um, and then I uh, helped found the. Uh, National Football fo uh, Foundations. Tell us a little about that, and then also that leads into that question. You accepted the charter for the um, Northwest Indiana chapter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We uh, that, that had been going though. That foundation had been in existence for some time. Oh yes. Nationally, just yes. not within Indiana. Is that correct? That's correct. In Indiana, there were at least two at that time. The Indianapolis chapter. Oh, there were a couple. Okay. And uh, the Moose Kraus chapter. Uh, Moose Kraus was an athletic director at Notre yeah. Dame. Up there. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, there were at least two chapters at that time. And in fact, <clears throat> when I was still in Chicago in 1991, I joined the Chicago chapter of the National Football Foundation and with the sole purpose of trying to get Dad into the National Football Hall of Fame. And I got all the paperwork and I actually got a couple of uh, the members of that chapter from Notre Dame, older members, uh, helping me. Because your father played. Yeah, yeah. And uh, got everything filled out and got it sent in and so forth. And uh, finally the word came back that it's all well and good, but we're sorry, a coach has to have been a coach for 10 years. And Dad was only coach for, I think, six or seven years. So that was the end of that. Well, I'm still going to figure that out. I think my chances will be better working through this chapter um, now. So uh, 
but I got uh, I had a got a connection somehow with the uh, executive director of the College Football Hall of Fame, which is in South Bend, or was at that time. It's still there. Yeah, they're going to move. They uh, are. Yes. They built that facility there. I, I know it. I know it. they're going to move to Atlanta, of all places. I don't. I don't know why. Uh, which is kind of sad because I thought that was, except that getting to South Bend isn't that easy in, unless you're an Irish reader. <laughs> but uh, hmm. is somebody taking it over? Or? I don't know what they're going to do with oh, that. Okay. It's, okay. Like you say, it could be a white elephant <laughs> for a while. Because um, it's I, I I've not been inside it, but I've been to South Bend, so I know where it's okay. I passed it quite a few times. I haven't been there lately. But yeah. It's, so oh, it's, it's a great very, location. Yeah, super good location. Very uh, well done. Lots of things for young people to do. Right. And, and uh, is it going to be a separate? Do you know is it going to be affiliated with something in Atlanta, or you don't know? It's just. No, I think they're going to just pick up the whole thing and move it down there. Just move it down there. Put it on stilts I, or something. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wherever the place is. <laughs> well, but go ahead on the chat. Um, I ran into this, and I can't remember how, but I came across a fellow by the name of Bernie Kish, and he was the executive director of the Hall of Fame. And uh, I invited him to come down to Kiwanis and speak to Kiwanis, and, uh, which, he, which he did, and he's a terrific man, uh, did a nice job. And, that, and I, I invited a couple of people from Purdue Athletics to come over and sit in with us. And uh, one did by the name of Jim Frugink, and Jim uh, was a sports information director at that time. And he became interested, and uh, kind of one thing led to another, and, and the chapter was established, and Jim had a lot to do with that, as did Coach Joe Tiller. Uh, he was behind it 100 percent because he had helped found one out in Wyoming. Oh, he, okay, so he knew about it. Yeah, yeah. Good. yeah. So that, and that thing has gone just gangbusters. Um, Is it one of the biggest chapters now, do you think? Yes, oh. one, one of the biggest in the country. And we were shooting to be the biggest in Indiana and to get more than what they had at uh, Indianapolis chapter. And uh, Bernie Flowers, a uh, graduate, an All-American from Purdue, uh, is now vice president of membership and he is he, he sold insurance all, all his life <laughs> to also, make a living. Also, he's a sandwich living. named after him at the Triple X. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so Bernie's done a tremendous job getting people signed up and uh, getting everybody else enthused about going after members. So we've grown quite a bit. We're one of the, one of the largest in the country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and wasn't how did you decide to change the name? Uh, put Joe Tiller's name, the chapter's name. Well, I, I did think that had to. Did the members have to vote on that, or? Oh yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We discussed it, and the fact that he had been so supportive, sure. and uh, he, he'd get his staff to join it and so forth, and uh, but he was always very encouraging. Yeah, so, nice person. Uh, we thought that would be, uh, and and the uh, the name stands out. Much better than Northwest Chapter. <laughs> <laughs> the name's the game. Right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like on the plaque. Yeah. We didn't charge him any extra dollars for <laughs> using then his name. he said, name. yes, okay. <laughs> you can have my name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. that's about where we are today. Yeah. Tell us a, a couple of things about your father you remember. And also, uh, to, uh, maybe let's start with the, the awards, that he was inducted into the Alumni Hall of Fame at Purdue. Sports Hall of Fame. The Sports Hall of yeah. Fame at Purdue, mm -hmm. which is really... Were you there at the at the cer ceremony? Yes, yes, I was. Um, Any other family members did, were there? My brother, brother uh, well, when they announced, well, they had the dinner. Sure. Uh, my brother and I and some of our cousins from... Dad was from, was from Plymouth, Indiana. And uh, so there were two, two or three of my cousins came down for that dinner. And uh, my brother and I were there, of course, and uh, accepted on Dad's behalf. Um, 
And then we went uh, the next, I want to say that was like on a Friday night, I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. at any rate, the next home football game, it was in the fall, the next home football game, they invited everybody that had been inducted to come down on the football field like they do now sure. in the games and introduced everybody. And, uh, so we got a thrill out of that. Uh, and that was in 98. And that, and that kind of uh, helped with my uh, association with Jim Drewgink because uh, prior to all this happening, uh, I took the application that I had worked up for the National Football Foundation in Chicago. For your father. For the for father, father and uh, got my brother and we went into Jim Brugink's office and sat down with him and uh, said, you know, we really think our dad ought to be in the, the Sports Hall of Fame. I think it started in 94 or something like that. Yeah. And uh, I was a little bit dismayed that he hadn't already been put in there. So we talked to Jim and gave him a copy of the information of his career. And uh, I said, Jim, do you think it might help if I could find out some of the committee members and kind of lobby them a little bit about this? And he said, no, I wouldn't advise that. He said, I've seen that backfire on people. And I said, oh, okay, well, I won't try and do that. Well, I found out later that Jim was one of the members of the committee. <laughs> so that, uh, I, that e I had either advantage. helped myself or, or hurt it, but uh, it helped it. So um, the other another thing that maybe you could talk the uh, Nobel Kaiser Award for Academic Leadership. Are you familiar with that award? Yeah. Okay. That, yeah, that's uh, that's and through. The winner uh, for 2008, as I said off camera before we got started, uh, was Kyle Adams, and it's given every year at the annual end of the season football banquet. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, which is co-sponsored uh, with Purdue, uh, co-sponsored by the Lafayette Kiwanis Club. That's right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's one that's. Has that been going? It's been for there. Some time? Yeah, I don't know when it started, but okay. it's been there for years and years, and it's based on. Uh, Academics and also leadership, and right. um, they they pick out you, usually the guys uh, that are chosen have good GPAs and uh, uh, have shown leadership ability and and uh, are also good athletes. Right. And uh, yeah, I met. Uh, I try and make it a, a practice to go up after the banquet's over and meet the sure. award winner and I met Kyle Adams last fall and mm -hmm. he's an outstanding young man yeah. and uh, that's uh, that's very nice that's and great then, and then your father was inducted in the Indiana Football Hall of Fame in 77 is that correct yeah right. yeah uh, did you go to we, we didn't get in on that okay. no uh, that's down at Richmond I've been there mm -hmm. uh, and seen their museum and, and uh, it's well it's well done and uh, I think my high school coach is in there also and so they, they've done a nice job sure. with that nice, yeah. um, any comments you'd like to say about do you recall about your father did you go to any of the, the games when uh, you were when he was be coaching um, well I, I don't think I remember him too well okay uh, the last last season he coached was in 1936 uh, at that time I was just going on three sure. <laughs> so no I uh, did your mother go to the games yeah I think she, I think she did sure. yeah. yeah and I, I'm sure my brother did he was about four years older than I okay. oh, were you surprised when you came back and saw the renovation of the stadium oh yeah <laughs> No, we we uh, had come down once in a while and sure. uh, tailgated with my brother and his wife and friends and uh, school teacher friends and so forth. Uh, but my, it's really changed. Yeah. I saw a uh, as an aside. I saw. A, she said it's probably not an original, but a 
poster of Stuart Field, where Purdue used to play. It used to be right across the street from where the field house is. That's right, yeah. And uh, I've seen pictures in the debris of it, so I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, uh, oh, I know where Stuart Field was. <laughs> she said, oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Boy, that's, things have really changed. Yeah. Dad also... Uh, no, we haven't gotten into him too much, but... Uh, we'll make a couple comments, whatever you'd like to do. Yeah, uh, I better, because I may forget sure. him later. Go ahead. Uh, he was also, uh, besides, uh, we talked earlier about him, I, I always say him building the field house uh, during his athletic uh, director's job. He also uh, talked Purdue uh, Ed Elliott, probably who was the president at that time, into uh, making the, a golf course, which is, became the South Golf Course, which is now called the Ackerman. Uh, but he he got that going, and they they got the land, I think, either from David Ross or <laughs> George Hayde, somebody like that. And that's how that... Because there wasn't a golf course? That no. Uh, and the joke was that Kaiser doesn't have a place to play golf, so he's going to... Make get one. its own course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> close. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, did he uh, ever make any? Do you recall in the family ever discussing? Did he ever make any comments about Newt Rockney? Um, yeah. he played for him. Well, the the one the one story that I like is that Dad was uh, a couple things. Dad was a very good basketball player. And he was about 5'10 and 165 pounds, at least he was when he played for Rockney. But in Plymouth, Indiana, they didn't have a football team, so he'd never played football in his life. He just played basketball, and he was very good at it. So the story goes that uh, he was, he was pra and at a practice, and I don't know whether it was Notre Dame, when he was on the Notre Dame team or the YMCA, there was a lot of them that played on the YMCA teams, and then some of those got on Notre Dame's team. But at any rate, Rockney came to a practice, and he saw Dad playing. And he playing liked, basketball. Yeah, and he uh, apparently liked his athletic ability and so forth, so he asked Dad if he'd like to come out and try out for the football team. And uh, Dad said yes, and and uh, so he ended up playing uh, right guard, and he was, uh, Rockney called him his watch charm guard, because that time it, most of the plays were the, the guard would pull out and go around the end and block, and, and uh, he was good at that, evidently. <laughs> and uh, he became one of the seven mules. I read something about them that about the same time with the Four Horsemen, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, they were the shock troops for the Four Horsemen. Sure. Uh, turned out my uncle played right next to him, played right tackle, and he was a bigger guy. He was about six six one and one hundred and eighty pounds. And nobody would come. Dare try and play tackle today at, at 180 pounds. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> Not for long. But uh, the uh, and I've read I've read this. Rockney's uh, approach to that four horsemen team was: you guys understand that that the seven mules are are doing a heck of a job blocking for you, so you can get free and run all over the place. And if they started to lose sight of that. At the start of it, the next game, he'd send in what he called the shock troops, second and third stringers, and they <laughs> and the four horsemen just get bowled over by by the <laughs> offense uh, by by the other team. And then when he he thought the time was right, then he'd put in the seven mules and uh, away they'd go. <laughs> there go from there. Right. Yeah. Do you go to the football games since you returned? Oh yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Always have season tickets. And, Sit with my cousins. One, one of them's now from Jeffersonville, and one's from Plymouth. And and uh, their kids come to the games. Sure. Right. So we have quite a contingent that 
roots for him up there. And your brother still lives here? Is no, he, he passed he, away. Oh, okay. Yeah. Does he, he but he has, still have family here, your brother? Uh, he has a son here, uh -huh. uh, but his son is, has never uh, gotten into the sure. football throws. Let's talk a little about your family. Where are your children at, the point, at this point? Well, our oldest, uh, Jennifer, is out in uh, Everett, Washington. Her husband was with State Farm, and he got transferred out there. And uh, Had he been in Illinois before that? Uh, no, they had they had lived. He had to spend little time in headquarters during a training. Oh, I see. Time. Okay. But at that time, he was in uh, a claims office up in uh, Oak Creek, Wisconsin, which is not far from Chicago. And uh, so we thought that was fine. You know, we could always get to Oak Creek, but it's not that easy to get to Seattle. No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, her mother was really crushed with that. They Do they have any children? Yeah, they have three. Oh, okay. Two, two at Eastern Washington University, two boys, and a girl who's a sophomore, or a, I think a junior this year in high school. Okay, okay. But Jenny, so Jenny's, uh, she gets back home two or three times a year, and, and sometimes by herself, and she's just a, a terrific gal. Uh, our other daughter, our youngest uh, child, is Lisa, uh, McDonald and she and her family just moved down from from Chicago they lived on the near north side uh, walking distance to Lincoln Park mm -hmm. right by the lake and uh, moved down to West Lafayette uh, to be close to mom and dad and uh, she has two girls uh, a third grader and an eighth grader um, in the middle we had our son Noble Eric Kaiser, and he passed away, oh, it's been 21 years ago. Uh, he had Hodgkin's uh, disease, and it went un undetected for sure for a year. And, How old uh, was he at the time? He was about 26, and uh, we had one of the best, what we thought, and I still think, was one of the best uh, cancer Hodgkin's type uh, physicians in Chicago. Sure. That's when we lived in Chicago. And uh, he sit and the doctor I can remember said, "Well, let's keep an eye on this for about a year or so." And and uh, he had a lump on his left side of his neck. And uh, so we we went along with him and uh, came back and after a year and the doctor said, "Oh my God," because it wasn't any less and it was a little bit bigger. So he ended up with going through the chemo while he was still in school. He was at the University of Illinois. And uh, chemo and uh, radiation. Um, and then he uh, graduated. Uh, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa and he, he uh, got accepted to the Michigan Law School, which he was very proud of. And then he had a setback, and uh, they decided that a uh, bone marrow uh, transplant. Uh, transplant would be needed. And believe it or not, his sister Lisa uh, matched him. So uh, she gave the bone marrow, and it, it was too far along and just didn't work. So that was a hard one to take. Yes. Yeah. Um, but you started saying one of your daughters has moved back here. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Lisa. Well, my wife. Uh, my wife's doing pretty well. She has uh, emphysema and uh, uh, problems with blockages in her legs and so forth. So Lisa said. She wanted to be close to mom and help out and so forth. And uh, so that's worked out very good, well. Good. Where, they, where do they live? They live in West Lafayette okay. in the University Farms area. Okay. And uh, That's all new from one of the years ago, even from oh, since yeah. I came. I mean, that was just cut my arm just where the research park was all open out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. right? No, it's, it's changed a lot. And... Uh, 
The only place that hadn't changed is the old neighborhood in Hills and Dales. <laughs> That's right, exactly. That's right. The people have changed. And but... Harry's Chocolate Shop is still here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, the uh, oh, one thing I wanted to mention, too, was um, back to Notre Dame, Uncle Rip, Rip Miller, um, no relation to Don Miller, who was one of the four, four horsemen. horsemen. Right. Uh, there were no relation at all, but Rip uh, somehow started dating this gal from Elkhart, and she was a younger, I think she was almost a teenager. Um, and he liked her a lot, and she liked him. Well, then he got, got a hold of Dad and said, hey, Esther's got a sister. <laughs> I want you to meet her. She's a, she's a, quite a gal. So, to make a long story short, they both married sisters, and uh, uh, Rip's wife, Esther, and Esther, is I think she'll be 103 next month. She's still going strong. She's she uh, she lived in South Bend or in that area? No, they she live they live in Annapolis. Annapolis, Maryland? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Rip went from Notre Dame to an assistant coach job in uh, um, Bloomington. And then the, the head coach, I can't recall his name right now, he got a job at Navy, and he took some of his staff, including Rip, with him, like they usually do. And uh, Rip coached for a while during World War II and so forth. And... Uh, then he became assistant athletic director, and he held that at Annapolis at, Annapolis at the Naval Academy. And uh, he held that job, I think he was with them over, a little over 40 years. And he'd come out, he did some recruiting, and he was kind of, he was a, how do they say that, uh, uh, hail fellow or hardy fellow or you know, he's just a backslapper and very friendly and yeah. outgoing and whatever. Yeah. In fact, he's in the uh, college hall of fame. Oh. And I asked him one time. I said, "You know, I'd, we'd like to get Dad in the hall of fame, Uncle Rip." He said, "I said, how how do you go about that?" He said, "Strictly politics." <laughs> so he made enough good contacts through that. Probably. <laughs> that according according to him, case, I mean, yeah. I'm sure. It, it's more than that, but uh, that was kind of discouraging <laughs> to hear, but believable. <laughs> but uh, his wife, your uh, your aunt, is going to be a hundred. Is a hundred and three. Will be a hundred and three November thirteenth. We uh, we went out to her hundredth hundredth birthday. Drove out there and just had a great time. Does she, she live by herself or in a retirement community or? It's kind of a retirement uh, community, but it's a, an apartment type setup. Sure, okay. Like Westminster, you can get apartments or houses. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in case, uh, like Westminster, if there's a medical problem or something, uh, they've got facilities there to help. Uh, but she's mentally sharp as ever and uh, physically. She said uh, at her 100th birthday, she said they had a little croquet match out in the center of this this area uh, where the buildings were around this area and she was pretty good at croquet but she said girls I'm going to have to retire she said I just can't bend over that far anymore <laughs> so you know what they did they went out and had a new ro <laughs> croquet mallet built with a long handle on it so she could just stand up and just push it through the hole yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh and she played golf up to a couple of years ago. And she's just amazing. And she's in good health. Yeah, yeah. Great. Just wonderful. amazing. Are you going to go out for the birthday this year? I'd like to because I, I keep thinking, well, this could be the last one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you never know. Yeah, I'd really like to. But. Uh, any closing, any other comments that you, something that you would uh, like to say or? Uh, yeah, there was one, a couple things about Dad's career. Um, 
when he when he came to Notre Dame or to uh, from Notre Dame to Purdue, he would have been 24. He was born in 1900 uh, in March of that year, and uh, he had he was a little bit older because he had dropped out of high school uh, when World War One was going on, and he joined the Marines, and he spent I don't know maybe a little bit less than a year, because they had, then they had the armistice in 1918. And I think he was either class of 1917 or 18. So he came back to school, to high, uh, high school in Plymouth, and uh, he was he was uh, the track coach. They needed a track coach at that time, so he in coached that. In high school? Yeah. So as a senior, he was coaching the, the track team. <laughs> And playing basketball, uh, so he was a little bit older when he went to Notre Dame. The point is, when he came to Purdue in 1925, he was 25. And then in 1930, Jimmy Fallon, who was also a Notre Dame graduate that played for Rockney, got a job at the University of Washington, and Ed Elliott at, the, at that time, the president, made Dad. Uh, head coach. He was 30 years old. The youngest one at that time in the Big Ten and could have been in the country. And then in 1933 he was named athletic director also. And still pro- coaching at the same time. Yeah, and still coaching uh, which, which I I would think was fairly unheard heard of then. It is today certainly but but I think back then there was probably four or five coaches on the coaching staff and today there's <laughs> you name it um, so that there was there weren't as many sports either that's right that's right very few yeah um, and then in 1934 uh, the year I was born dad uh, was uh, I'll show you a, a clip of it but uh, dad was voted uh, to be the head coach of the all-star football game, the first one that they had um, that the uh, Tribune, Chicago Tribune Charities established. And it was their first all-star game. They had about, I think, two or three weeks to put together a, a team of all stars from all the colleges around the country, and it, Dad and uh, Bob Zupke of Illinois and and Dick Hanley of Northwestern were assistant coaches, and uh, they played the Chicago Bears, who were the champions of the professional football league at that time, and the, the ending result was zero zero tie, so they. <laughs> They held the, the Bears to no scores. <laughs> and they had this election they had. Uh, they had 617,000 people send in votes on who they wanted to be the head coach. And Dad won that. And he'd been head coach for four years at Purdue. So They played in Soldier's Field probably, didn't yeah, they? Yeah. The first game was at the Soldier's sure, Field. Sure, And that lasted, oh, probably until 43 44 or something in there. Uh, but I thought that was quite an accomplishment. Uh, one time he was, when he was ill, uh, we were living in, I believe, Albuquerque. Um, No, it was in 1937, so he, he was not coaching in 37. So we were out there, and he made uh, the first pep, pep talk via the telephone. He called them at halftime and uh, got them fired up to... Uh, he called the team? Yeah. Oh, okay. Called Purdue, the, the Purdue team? Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. And uh, that was the first time I think they'd, anybody had ever done that. Uh, and uh, I think that I think that was the Indiana game. 
What could be better? <laughs> yeah, it was. Memorial Stadium at Indiana University on oh. no November 20th, 1937. Oh. oh, nice. So that was... That's kind of unique. That yeah. The first first thing that's done, that's really good. And we used to, uh, you know, that was a time when the universities in the Midwest, and I think probably all over the country, were trying to expand their interest uh, as far as fan interest and so forth. Well, he had, uh, for example, he had Jimmy Crowley, who was one of the four, four horsemen, who was a uh, coach of Fordham in New York. Well, they, he helped with Jimmy to get a, a game with Fordham going, and uh, so they, you know, they take the train out there and all that good stuff. But uh, he did a lot of things like that, and, and at one time we had a a, a, a recording, uh, a record of an interview he had while he was out there for the radio with one of the New York City stations. They were interviewing him for the game and so forth. Um, I'm not sure if we still have that or not. Between my brother and I, things got kind of split up. <laughs> it often happens that yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he... He was not only a good coach, but he was a good uh, uh, administrator, uh, a bit, almost a businessman. His, his major was in commerce at Notre Dame. That's what they called it then. In then, right, yeah. And uh, not too bad for a kid that came from a farm, t farm town. And he started very young and did very well. Yeah. As an early yeah. person. Was his office, would that have been in Lambert? Was that with him where Elvis? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it so was. So that was just a field house. Of course, Mackey wasn't built, and there weren't any offices probably in Ross 8 at all. I doubt no, it. No, no. So it have to be in, in Mackey then. Yeah, in fact, I do remember, uh, I'm glad you said that, because I, I do remember that a friend, a buddy of mine, and we had to be about four or five, I'm, I'd like to say five, <laughs> um, decided we'd go down and visit Dad in his office. So <laughs> Jack Rosser and I had played together all the time. Off we went down Northwestern Avenue. The two of you? Uh-huh. Five? Yep. And uh, that I can remember. I can remember walking to his, into his office and his jaw dropping. <laughs> what are you kids doing? <laughs> We just came down to see you, Dad. <laughs> Let's see where you work, right? <laughs> I'm sure he got on the phone with Mother saying, what are you doing? <laughs> what, do, you know, do you know where your sons are? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun. Uh, but uh, he was, and I understand he was a very uh, quiet person. Uh, the, one of the boss mentors I had at Sears in the Chicago area said he had a very good friend who went to Purdue and he, he said she told me one time that she was upset about something with either with school or with her family or something and she was sitting on a bench on the campus crying and this man came by and stopped and said are you alright? It was dad and he talked to her and got her settled down and he was just that kind of person and uh, he used to be a barber shop next to where uh, Chocolate's, Harry's Chocolate Shop is Red's Barber Shop and Red said, told me one time because I, I went to Red for haircuts and I took my son there to, for his haircuts and he said, you know, your dad always stopped, had something to say it wasn't just hi and walk on by. He'd always stop and talk. And uh, so I, I don't know. I just think uh, he must have really you know, made an been impact. so well faceted in so many areas. Right. It just uh, and started out at a very young age. And what did yeah. he uh, had he been sick for a while? Was that? Yeah, he he had to step down from coaching because of his, he had a kidney ailment. Oh, okay. Uh, nephritis, I think they called it. Okay. And some hypertension. 
And uh, at that time, the doctors didn't know what, much what to do with di uh, There wasn't dialysis. Right. Uh, what to do with kidney problems. And they, they'd say, go out west in the wintertime and you'll feel better. <laughs> Until you got the drips out of it. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we lived several different places out there. Sure. Any any other thing else you think of that you'd like to share with us? Is are they is he buried here, or is no? He's buried in Plymouth. Oh, okay. Yeah. And is your mother buried there as well? No, she uh, she's buried with her family up in Elkhart. Oh, okay. Yeah, she was buried here in uh, Grandview in, in West Lafayette, but uh, we had her disinterred and, sure. and sent up to uh, because. Things didn't work out. Her, her uh, husband Bud Winfield. Oh, she remarried. Yeah, oh, she okay. remarried. Okay. And uh, so my stepfather, when she died, uh, he remarried, and he and his, his then second wife um, decided to be out in Tip Canoe Gardens and. <laughs> So we thought, well, we're not going to leave mom there all no, by herself. So. She's got friends <laughs> elsewhere, right? Yeah, that's yeah, right. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for this interview. It's been very nice. I've enjoyed it. Well, I thank, thank you, you very, very much, much Kathy. Thank you. <laughs>